recycling byproducts in construction and artificial intelligence applications in materials and structures. He being a prolific author with more than 500 research publications, which was listed in the world's 60th most impactful civil engineers by Elsevier and Shanghai Global Ranking and in Standard University's world top one percentage scientist. Professor Nairi is a fellow of Canadian Academy of Engineering, the Engineering Institute of Canada, the American Concrete Institute, the Canadian Society for Civil Engineering, and the Asia Pacific Artificial Intelligence Association. He received numerous prestigious awards, including the Engineering Medal for Research and Development from Professional Engineering Ontario, the Ontario Premier's Research Excellence Award, the ACA Award for Professional Achievement, the CSE Horst Leipzig Medal, and the CSE Whitman Wright Award, the Bill Curtin Medal from the UK's Institution for of Civil Engineers, the ASEE Faculty Fellow Award for Excellence in Engineering Education, the Engineering Prize for Excellence in Teaching, along with several Best Paper Award and other recognitions. He has been invited as distinguished keynote speaker in numerous international forums and conferences. Dr. Nedi has been providing consulting services for world's landmark structures and construction projects. So let's all welcome Professor Mansaf and Nehidi, who is here with us for the third keynote Over to you, sir. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for the very generous and flattering introduction. I'd like to first thank the organizers of this event, uh, the Federal Institute of Science and Technology, and everyone who was involved in uh, making this event a success. Very pleased to be um, your guest today, delivering the keynote presentation. It's still good morning here in, in Canada. Um, when I was invited to deliver this keynote, I was uh, thinking about what I should be talking about. And I was tempted to either talk about some of the research that we are conducting in my lab with my research group or some of the international projects that I was involved with. And each of those would be sufficient for this talk today. Uh, however, I, I selected to tackle a different issue uh, of, of importance and that I feel passionate about. I know this event is about, you know, sustainability and quality in, in construction. Uh, I wanted to um, go beyond, you know, beyond our uh, successes for those who work in academia, um, trying to publish more papers or getting more grants or, or winning more awards and, and beyond, you know, the achievements of those of us who work in the industry getting more projects, uh, more profit, uh, achieving growth. I wanted to focus on something different, and that is that we have really an ethical mission, an important mission for all of us who are involved one way or the other in the built environment. I, I wanted to, to send a particular message to all those young engineers out there in India and elsewhere around the world for those who are attending this event, whether on the platform of this conference or on the YouTube channel, that um, we have an important role, an important role to play for saving our planet, for saving uh, the future generations, and for um, establishing uh, more equity and more inclusivity, uh, and, and to resist all those temptations of, uh, of discrimination based on any um, ethnic or, or gender or, or religious uh, or other considerations, but we need to work as, as humans hand in hand in a concerted manner um, in an effort to tackle the, the gigantic issues that are facing humanity uh, today. So uh, I will cover a few points and try to stick with my time. Um, I will talk a little bit about the climate crisis that we're facing the issues around associated issues and pressures on infrastructure, civil infrastructure construction uh, by, by population growth, the decaying existing infrastructure that prematurely uh, happening around the globe, uh, the challenges posed by the fourth industrial revolution and the adaptations that we need to do in our domain. 
and, and, and some of the gaps that we still face in engineering education to address those major issues. And maybe if I have time, I will mention a few things that I am working with, with my uh, research team here at, at the university. So uh, I'm not gonna educate you on climate change. It's, it's, it's happening uh, much more quickly than we ever feared. Um, the climate emergency is a race we are losing, but it's a race we can still win as so well stated by UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres recently. Um, we all experience rising temperatures that are fueling environmental degradation, distinction, extinction of, of species of, of uh, uh, animals and, and plants, more frequent and intense disasters and weather extremes, more hurricanes, more floods, more droughts. Um, associated with this is a growing problem of food and water insecurity, economic destructions, and, and that can be associated with growing conflicts, uh, migrations, violence, and, and other problems on the international scene. We see the sea levels rising dra dramatically, the Arctic is melting, and we experience that here in Northern Canada. Coral reefs around the globe are, are dying and oceans are acidifying, and forests are, are, are burning. Uh, so unfortunately, what we experience and see is that the business is continuing as usual, and that is not acceptable. Um, as the infinite cost of climate is, is rising and rising uh, dramatically, uh, we're experiencing more and more irreversible events. And, and now, now is, is the time for bold action, and we need to do some, something to, to help from every position we are in. Um, uh, Climate used to be perceived as a problem of the poor countries. It's far from us, it's not our problem. You know, we can continue to be rich here in North America and Europe, and you know, it's not gonna touch us. Uh, uh, that's definitely proven wrong. Uh, there is no corner of the globe that is now perceived as immune from the devastating consequences of climate change. The pictures that you see there are about 17 hours ago in the city of New York, where uh, fires in, in Canada are bringing smoke and covering you know, New York, Washington, the capital city of the United States, the capital city of Canada. You know, you may afford an expensive mask you know, to protect your nose, but you cannot protect yourself from climate change unless all of us work together in a concerted manner to try to fight uh, the problem. So um, it, it is a problem that has been primarily created by the rich, but it's impacting more the vulnerable countries, yet no one is immune. And here in Canada, I just showed you like, we have we have tremendous amounts of, of forest fires. When I came to Canada here about 34 years ago, um, the entire summer I'm waiting for a warm day, you know, with, with dreaming that I can go to the beach or something. And it was cold and rainy and, 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 and frozen in the winter. And that has all changed within you know, my life span here from a student to become, becoming a professional, seeing more uh, floods and more extreme events that are happening everywhere around the world. Yet we continue to emit billions of uh, carbon dioxide, and billions of tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere every year. Um, we are generating greenhouse gas emissions at record levels never experienced before. Uh, uh, and yet, and yet we seem to be on track to maintain the business as usual trajectory, which is extremely dangerous. The last four years have been the hottest on record ever. And we are definitely one degree C above, you know, the pre-industrial era and, and, and close to a level where scientists perceive it as an unacceptable risk as per a recent World Meteorological Organization report. And if we don't slow down the emissions, if we don't do our part in the construction and in the built environment and in, in every engineering field we are involved in, temperatures could rise to above three, degree, three degrees Celsius by 2100. Uh, that is not far away from now. And that will definitely cause a tremendous irreversible dam damage to our ecosystems. So um, we are experiencing the glaciers and ice sheets you know, in the polar areas and high mountains melting and melting very rapidly, causing rapid uh, rise of, of sea levels. Um, the dangers are, are, are paramount. Uh, almost two thirds of the world's population 
uh, lives uh, within short distance from 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 the coasts. Uh, about forty percent of the world's population is is hundred kilometers from from the coast, and we could see within our lifetime. Uh, we don't have to wait very long to see uh, big cities around the world like New York, Shanghai, uh, Abu Dhabi, Osaka, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, and many other cities could be just under under sea uh, under under sea water. Um, the other aspect of this is that climate change is impacting food and water security. Uh, climate change is a direct cause of soil erosion. Uh, about half a billion people now around the globe live in areas affected by erosion, where about third, one third of, of the food is, is lost due to erosion or, or, or entirely wasted. We're experiencing crops that have been thriving uh, for centuries and centuries. We see them now struggling to survive because of, of climate change and, and making food uh, security more precarious. Um, with that associated the availability of, of water for agriculture, for drinking water, uh, and, and we're seeing at this stage about 2.2 billion people around, around the globe without you know, sustained access to safe drinking water, according to the World Health Organization, the UNICEF, and that is uh, getting worse and worse. Uh, in a, a report, in a recent report in October 2022, by the United Nations Environmental Program, uh, the, the the closing window, the climate crisis calls for rapid and rapid transformational changes to be able to curb, you know, the greenhouse gas emissions and the associated climate change. And yet, the international community is, is falling far short. Uh, we have made promises in the Paris Agreement and other agreements that I will mention in a minute. And, and, and yet we're not meeting those, those commitments. And at this stage, it's becoming a crisis and, and only an urgent, you know, system-wide, transformational, uh, far-reaching uh, changes can help avoid or curb the climate change. From our side, people involved in, in construction and civil engineering and the built environment, uh, our, the contribution of our sector to this problem is, is colossal. Um, about 40% of global greenhouse gas emissions are associated with, with the built environment. And as we experience growing urbanization around the globe, um, this impact increases in proportion. So when you look at the distribution of, of, of the glo uh, global greenhouse gas emissions by the different sectors of the economy, you see major ones coming from energy uh, use in, in buildings about 18% or so, and then the transportation sector 16%. And if you add to that cement and, and steel and a few other sectors, you could easily realize that the impact of what we do in the built environment is, is fundamental. So uh, the International Panel on Climate uh, Change states that rapid and far-reaching tra transitions across all sectors and across all systems are, are needed and necessary to be able to achieve some sustained and, and impactful emission reductions uh, and secure the livable and sustainable future for all of us. And if we don't do anything, we are really incurring large risks. The way we have been handling this so far has not been successful. And I want to try to explore some of the reasons why uh, this is happening. We've, we've been introducing the concept of sustainable development and sustainability and yet, when you talk to many professionals, this, this concept is rather vague. It's not quantitative. It's not well defined. It lacks substance. It's ambiguous. And this has led to failures in attaining the, the universal uh, you know, uh, goals that we were pursuing. And, and, and ignoring the policy making aspects and the complexity of the problem uh, have not allowed us to, to attain uh, significant successes. And I will cover a bit of history here to bring to your attention the implications of the trend of what we have been planning versus what have been achieved. So uh, 1972, the UN Scientific Conference was uh, was organized, is called also the first Earth Summit. It was organized in Stockholm, Sweden in, in June 1972. And that was the first time there was a declaration uh, around the issue of climate change. 
And uh, several years later, in 87, the UN General Assembly uh, adopted the environmental uh, perspective to the year 2000 and beyond and introduced the concept of sustainable development. And yet this document is a long document that is disappointing, didn't really put um, climate change in focus or, or give it the, the attention it requires. A year later, uh, there was the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, that was established in November 88. And that was a, uh, the first, perhaps, powerful initiative around the, the problem of climate change. And the forum for examination of the greenhouse warming and global climate change was established. Yet, there was many skeptics that were not believing in this. Uh, I remember myself a few years back, just uh, a lot of debate and people denying that climate change exists and there is no effect of you know, uh, human activity on climate change and it was controversial. We still see uh, political leaders around the world who, who are decision makers, you know, not believing in that climate change is the reality and it's happening, which is, which is quite disappointing. 1989 was really the, the watershed year for climate change and there have been many things done that, that, that year. Uh, the, the global uh, uh, warming and climate change has been put on the policy table and the policy agenda clearly for the first time. The General Assembly of the UN identified the climate change as, as an urgent and very specific issue. There was a resolution uh, around, around the, the, the framework convention on climate change. There was the Maldives uh, declaration uh, and around the global warming and sea level rising. There was the Helsinki De Declaration of Protection of Ozone Layer and the Montreal Protocol. So what activities began to become more intense around the issue of climate change at that time. And in, uh, a couple of years later, the World Climate Conference uh, further enhanced, you know, emphasized the problem. Then there was the 1992 General Assembly in, in Brazil, in Rio de Janeiro, uh, which started reflecting global consensus on the problem of climate change. It's probably so far the most uh, significant event around climate, climate change. It has seen the opening of the signature of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And uh, uh, in about, uh, very shortly, about 160 countries signed up. So we are in 1992. The problem of climate change is not substantial yet. There was a lot of world leaders and countries committing to curbing climate change. There was a time where it could have been an inflection point where we could have done an impact. So why are we still talking about climate change right now? Uh, in 95, the Berlin mandate uh, called the Conference of the Parties, what now you, you call now COP, what, the COP conference, the Convention of Parties. Uh, so COP1 was 95 and it was in, in Germany and in Berlin then. There was COP2 in Geneva, Switzerland in a year later. And then in 97, there was the, the famous Kyoto, Kyoto Protocol in Japan, which is the COP3, which perhaps so far was the most impactful climate change action taken. Uh, commitments, so commitments on paper, aimed at reducing CO2 of the industrialized countries by at least 5% below 1990. Now, we're talking 1997, and here I am talking to you about you know 26 years later telling you that we're still conducting things business as usual without really significant uh, changes um the most cop is cop 27 you probably heard about it in the media it was in Sharm el sheikh in egypt in last november and you wonder what we have achieved with all these conventions 27 cops if all these conventions focus it on one single thing that is creating an exponential growth of greenhouse gas emissions, they would have not been more successful than they have been. So you look like the, the levels of CO2, the historical levels not changing really significantly. And then, you know, at about the time we started being concerned and worried about the climate change and making policies to reduce CO2 emissions, here's what we have achieved. We have achieved a very rapid exponential growth in carbon dioxide emissions from all sectors of the economy, construction included. So the question becomes, why do we keep failing and failing miserably in this manner? Um, so 
uh, if you look at the global average temperature between 1950 and 2019, and, and you look at the era where we started making policies, right? This is the time where really intervened with climate change, trying to avoid the problem. And this, this is the temperature trend that is, that is happening. So again, why we keep, we keep failing. Um, looking closer to our turf, um, if we look at our industry, like the things we are involved with as civil engineers. Uh, so uh, after fossil fuels and land use change, uh, uh, the, 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 the third largest source of anthropogenic emissions of carbon dioxide is, is from the global cement industry. And if you consider the cement and concrete industry as a country, it would rank third after China and the United States as the major source of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And a lot of this, 66% of these emissions just happened since we started making climate policies in the, you know, just around 1990 and up. We have, so 44% of the entire history versus 66% since 1990 and things are getting worse as we produce now about 4.2 billion tons of cement around the globe and uh, and every ton of cement releases approximately one ton of co2 so that that results in somewhere between six and eight percent of co2 emissions resulting from uh from cement production and yet the co2 utilization market is expected to reach 600 billion us dollars uh, of annual revenue so the, the entire issue that goes around co2 and how you can use co2 and save co2 is a huge market that is so so it, it's a problem and an opportunity uh, uh, this time of, of challenge it's a time of great peril but also a time of opportunity and in such context we really need um uh, you know great leadership to step to the plate and, and help uh, resolving the, the challenges so again, you know, um, <clears throat> cement released CO2 uh, in time, and you look between 1960 and uh, more recently, and you see the trend clearly showing. It. And, and we are outgrowing the other sectors. It's not like every other sector is emitting CO2, so we are emitting as much. We are actually emitting more than the other sectors of the economy in the in the construction. Now, not to portray a bleak picture of all of this, there have been some success. So, for example, the use of supplementary cementitious materials, things like fly ash and slag and cement kiln uh, dust and other things that have re reduced the consumption of, of cement to some extent. There are emerging opportunities and areas of research, the alkali activated materials, the limestone calcinated clay cements, and some other technologies around carbon sequestration and mineralization of, of CO2. But these are not enough and they're not making the needed impact. We really need transformative, uh, much more disruptive solutions. Uh, those still uh, yet need to be developed. Um, a lot of the literature that you see around uh, reducing CO2 emissions and sustainable materials and all that, but that is published in the literature amounts to greenwashing. Uh, because it doesn't it doesn't capture all of the parameters around the, the situation. Uh, people publish a paper saying we're going to save 50, 60 percent of CO2, and when you look at it, it really doesn't. Maybe it even generates more more CO2. So a lot of money for research and development spent, a lot of pros and claims, and yet the impact is very limited. Because um, the bottom line is that you know the emissions are increasing very rapidly. Why why are we failing? Uh, one of my takes on this is that, you know, we're not capturing the problem the way we should. So this, this graph here, you see there, that's from my little daughter elementary school. Uh, and that's how, you know, sustainability is represented. Huh? So that graph is from an elementary school book. Um, what the Barry Richmond, whom I'm gonna talk about in a minute, call it the laundry list thinking. <laughs> You're thinking like you're making your laundry list. It's too too simplistic. So you think perhaps in our business, like in the cement and concrete industry, we are more sophisticated than this. But here's some representation of how sustainability around cement and concrete is represented. And when you look at it, it's, it's not much more complex or not really more involved or, or sophisticated compared to my little daughter elementary school. So 
Why is this? Is because we keep um, we keep using mental models, uh, the laundry list thinking to solve the problem. And I give you some examples just for fun to illustrate the concept. So somebody tells you, you know, sales in their market are bad because they're not doing mar good marketing. Marketing is bad. And then you could follow the same logic. Like um, the mental model will tell you, well, marketing is, is bad because the salespeople are not motivated. And then you could follow that thinking and say the salespeople are not motivated because of this, because of that. So the mental thinking can always find another event that causes the one you thought it was the cause. Um, it's difficult to see the complexity and the interrelationships. Some phenomena are time dependent and they are time dependent with feedback loops that are non-linear and complex. And therefore the mental thinking approach that I presented over there, the, 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 you know, is not, is not capable because mental models are generally fuzzy. They are incomplete and they are imprecise. They change over time. I could sit with you over coffee and we start debating something and probably within the same discussion, you're going to shift. You can change your mind within the same debate. So we keep, if we keep analyzing complex problems, using policies that are based on very simplistic mental models, then we cannot solve the problem. We're making it even, even, even worse. So handling multi-loop nonlinear feedback systems, complex systems, using contemplation and intuition and discussion and guesswork is usually futile and doesn't lead to adequate results. So graphically, you know, to make this even more uh, cartoonish, you know, if, if somebody is sitting on this on this side of the boat and you see the other side sinking, he said, I'm, uh, you know, I am, I'm sure so happy and glad that the hole is not on our end. Well, that's, that's how some of the countries are handling the problem of climate change. You know, if the Maldives are sinking, I'm not going to be sinking. I'm okay, I'm happy, right? Uh, they don't see the complexity uh, in the system thinking approach, you know? You know, the mental model, you think if you push this side, it doesn't affect the other side. Systems thinking, which I'm introducing here, sees the interrelationships. Uh, if you push this side, you could create a cascading effect leading to the to failure from the other side. We need to capture the complexity. So if I take my the model of my little daughter from the elementary school textbook, and I translate it into a, a systems thinking model that you see on this side, you immediately realize the complexity there are, these things are interrelated. They, 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 they feed back into each other in a time dependent manner and in a nonlinear manner that is very complex and we cannot capture using simplistic mental models. So uh, what systems thinking? We need to, we need to, uh, to uh, you know, shift from the laundry list thinking approach in dealing with climate change and CO2 emissions to the systems thinking approach where you know, uh, we need a holistic approach to, to capture the, the factors and the interrelations and the interactions that contribute to the possible outcomes. Um, approaches that, that, can, that can model the complex systems that are nonlinear and governed by, by feedbacks by, uh, that could be adaptive and, 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 and at times counterintuitive. Uh, things that allow us to see the whole, the big picture, rather than just snapshots of, of the little a problem. Um, and by that, I mean, um, give you an example of, 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 of a problem that, that, that brings this to, to a more tangible understanding. Let's say we have a traffic congestion problem in, in a city. Uh, the policymakers will say, will think, oh, okay, well, let's say, let's, you know, we can solve this problem. If we generate enough money, we can build a nice highway. And, and then it happens, you know, we spend public money on building a nice highway. Uh, then what happens is that we, after a while, the traffic becomes worse. So we, we wasted pu public money, but we didn't produce the outcomes. What happens is that you build a nice highway, traffic initially becomes very nice. People start thinking, oh, I really like that suburb, that area. I'm going to, I'm going to move there, you know, and I'm going to buy a car because traffic is easier. So when people start having more cars traveling, the longer distances, the new suburbs get developed and what you have created to solve the problem creates a bigger, a bigger uh, problem. Another example, you know, you have a poor neighborhood in the city where, you know, the most poor people and, and you know, uh, people facing social issues all are condensed there, a lot of homeless in the streets. So the government comes and say, okay, 
let's build a lot of social housing in that area. We're going to solve the problem. So they create very cheap, low rent uh, social housing. And that area starts, starts to attract even more poor people. And, you know, the businesses that, that, that used to, to, to use that area, they realize that this area is growing in social problems, maybe in, in crime, because we haven't solved the root cause of the problem. And then they move out. So that area becomes poorer than it used to be before. And we create a bigger problem. We understand the picture. So perhaps that's what we have been doing in climate change curbing. We're not capturing the complexity of the problem. And the policies we have been implementing have done nothing except worsening the situation and making things much worse. So if I take the example of the traffic congestion, for example, how it can be modeled in systems in a causal diagram of systems thinking, trying to capture the complexity. And based on this, perhaps we can develop more robust policy making tool that addresses the, the problem in a more sophisticated manner. So what is systems? Dynamics and systems thinking, and as some of you may be very familiar with this and have you have used it in your research. It's work that is grounded in, in the work of, uh, of Forrester at the uh, MIT Slo uh, Sloan School of, of Management in the 1950s. It's a methodology that explores complexity and interconnectedness and change over time. Uh, so I, sometimes you hear me saying systems thinking and system dynamics. Systems thinking is, explores the interrelationships. Uh, it, it creates those causal diagrams that I showed you uh, in a minute. Um, something that you cre can create with a pencil on a, on a sheet of paper. System dynamics takes that beyond and creates, you know, the sophisticated computerized uh, platforms, programs that can solve the problems. For example, uh, software programs like Stella and, and Vensim are, are system dynamics uh, programs. So the concept is really looks at the kinds of feedback that exists. You know, there are different feedbacks in systems. Some, you know, uh, feedbacks is, is, is growth reaching the target and then stabilizing. And some, some others do the same thing, but then oscillate around the target. Some reach, you know, a peak and then they decay and so on. So we, we try to capture these using, you know, tools in, in computer programs. So for example, uh, what you see here, this is like the way we build blocks in, in, in a stellar uh, program system in dynamics. What you see is, is a connector, and a connector that is represented by an arrow, as you can see, represents, you know, relationships among various elements of the model. And then there are stocks that look like those uh, rectangles there, where, you know, things accumulate, physical or non-physical. For example, cement production or CO2 generation or something, they, they accumulate in the stock. And then the other component of the model is flows. Uh, flows are, uh, sorry, converters that are uh, that are represented by by circles, as you can see right there. And those are uh, tools to perform algebra. Um, for example, the event curves for for cement are represented by a function uh, that can be represented in the model that way. And then the last, uh, sorry, the last component is is the is the flows, which are represented by a tap uh, like that one, and they allow to transport quantities. Anyways. And then you see the pluses and minuses. The pluses mean, you know, more of the, the same thing will produce more, of, you know, of the other thing, or less of one thing will produce less of the other thing. So uh, if a person's uh, uh, self-esteem is low, then they accomplish less. If their self-esteem is high, they accomplish more. So that's an, a reinforcing uh, pattern. And then there is the balancing. The balancing is more of this, something produces less and vice versa. So if you spend more, you have less money in the bank. Anyways, we use these tools to create system dynamics models like this. Well, what I'm get, getting to here is that you wanna uh, you know, fight climate change and CO2 emissions, you need to capture the complexity of the problem and not think about it in a very linear, you know, simplistic way that has been producing counterintuitive results. So for example, take the effect of alkali activated materials on CO2 emissions. Some of us do research on alkali activated materials and every paper says, we're, produ you know, we're reducing CO2 emissions. Well, how, how did you get to that conclusion? Um, so we need to, when we put this into a model with a lot of complexity, you know, based on different assumptions, we can get different results. So this is the causal loop diagram. This is what I do with a pencil on a sheet of paper. This is how it gets translated to uh, system dynamics model in, in Stella. And then you would be surprised, and in every one of these sectors that you see there, that's a sector, this is a sector, 
every one of those sectors is actually a complex sector with many uh, in, inputs and, and influences and feedback loops and all that. And when you build all of this into a model, you see the different trends. These trends are all about the effect of alkali activated materials in, in, uh, as a binder, right? You see trends where, you know, it's decaying very rapidly or it's decaying then increasing or you see, you see all those different trends and those different trends capture complexity that we cannot think about, like we cannot capture in the mental model. These are based on assumptions. What happens to the economy in the next century? What happens to the world population in the next century? What incentives are provided for, you know, CO2 uh, reduction and, and what's the market of CO2 use and, and all that uh, and the policies around it. So, so different assumptions can, can lead to very different trends and the policies that we have implemented in the past perhaps did not capture this uh, level of complexity. So I will stop talking about this topic at, at that stage. There are a few uh, papers that we have published around the issue of, of system dynamics modeling. And uh, so uh, the first paper say, uh, is titled System Dynamics Model for Sustainable Cement and Concrete Novel Tool for Policy Analysis. It's published in ACI, and there are a few others that you could find in the, in the literature. And if you want to read more and learn more about this field, you could read J uh, Jay Forrester. He's the pioneer, in, or the pioneer of the, uh, the American computer engineer and systems scientist. Uh, he, he's the one who pioneered system dynamics, and his PhD student, Barry Richmond, um, uh, also have several textbooks. He's the one who took system dynamics to the business level and, and and, and uh, created the Stella uh, program uh, and created a company called uh, High Performance Systems around System Dynamics. And then the other PhD student, John Sturman, he's still at MIT and he's now the, uh, uh, the leader of the, of the Sloan School of Management uh, at, at MIT. And there is a website about System Dynamics so you can, you can pursue and learn this a little bit more. Um, I'm going to shift to another direction. Uh, so coupled with the problem of lack of understanding and the inadequate modeling and oversimplification, there is the problem of population population growth. Uh, population, the entire history of the humans never exceeded like the Roman time was like a quarter of, of a billion. And, and you know, by the time, you know, uh, North America or America was colonized, we were, humans were about half, half a billion. Uh, the first billion, if you're wondering, was maybe achieved around, probably around 1833. So it took the entire history for one billion until the, you know, 1800 something. And then the next billion took about 80 years, right? The most recent billions are achieved within the space of a decade, uh, 10 years, 12 years. Today, I checked the world population. I was looking at the numbers increasing as, as I speak, and, and, and uh, we are over 8 billion humans. Now we need schools, we need housing, we need water treatment, we need transportation systems, and uh, it's very demanding in terms of civil infrastructure. Coupled with this is the aging, civil, the, the infrastructure we design is aging prematurely. We design things for a service life of 80, 100 years, and yet you see within the space of a decade is deteriorating dramatically. The United States alone spends about $300 billion every year to deal with corrosion problems. About a third of that is reinforced concrete. So you're spending $100 billion on reinforced concrete corrosion. And you know, that's, that's more than the, the GDP of many countries in poor countries in small countries in, around the world. We spend that on, on a problem that we can avoid. Now, we end up with infrastructure that looks like this, problems that can literally be avoided. And because of the, the, the gap between material science and structural engineering. Structural engineers, and I'm one of them, no offense, we keep designing structures with, you know, just numbers, F prime C, modest plasticity, shrinkage strain. But when you put the structure in the real environment and how it interacts with it, so designing not just for structural integrity, but we need to design now more and more for durability, for sustainability, for decommissioning and, and, and many other aspects. So there is a large gap in, in, in that. Coupled with this, the traffic congestion problems around the world are, are increasing. Just this spot in Phoenix, Arizona, People spend 23 million hours stuck in that intersection. You can imagine the economic cost. The Americans spend 14 and a half million hours every day stuck in traffic. You can calculate the economic cost 
of that. A lot of billions of dollars associated with deteriorating infrastructure and a lot of mental health and psychological problems associated with, with actually traffic congestion. Uh, we continue polluting. We produce 280 million metric tons of solid waste in North America every year. When I came to Canada, I was, when I finished high school and came to Canada, I remember watching TV and somebody was talking about Toronto, our biggest city. He was saying it's New York run by the Swiss, meaning that it's a cosmopolitan big city like New York, and yet it has no problems. Uh, if you look at Toronto in the recent years, we're struggling with our garbage. We can take north, we can take south, the landfills are depleting, a lot of pollution around, around the globe. And with this came the, the issue that I just talked about, climate change and natural disasters. Uh, you know, just this event, uh, the, 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 uh, this cyclone, the, the Harvey hurricane in 2017 cost the economy $127 billion. We think that climate, we can continue climate change unabated and not calculating the implications and the costs associated with this. If we spend all this money trying to fight climate change rather than just dealing with the consequences, it would have been much more uh, productive. So we're facing tremendous problems and those tremendous problems cannot be solved by a software uh, that is advanced or a micromolecule and or it needs co hardcore civil engineering solutions. And yet, you know, the, the, the construction industry is the largest sector after healthcare. It's about 13% of the GDP. But you don't see the stock market going up and down because of the construction or anything like that. It's a very conservative business. It's very litigated business. It doesn't adopt innovation easily. It appears competition with margin, low margins of profit. And therefore, we need not, you know, uh, transformational changes to adapt to the challenges that we are, we are facing. There is an ongoing uh, we are, we really stand on the brink of a full-fledged fourth industrial revolution, a uh, huge shift from the analog to the digital. The boundaries between physical and biological systems are, are, are collapsing. And we see more and more, you know, generative systems like uh, chat GDP. That's going to come to structural engineering too, where you can press on a button and then you get hundreds of designs in, in a matter of seconds, as opposed to the laborious time consuming approach we teach our students. And you see more and more additive manufacturing transforming the construction in industry. Um, so we need really substantial uh, changes. Um, and yet, when you look at education, how we are educating the next generation of our students to face all these uh, challenges. So while the market is ready for, you know, novel engineers that are more educated on climate change, uh, for example, in Canada, we expect green jobs to, to increase by about 8%. Uh, and the largest sector with environmental uh, job postings in Canada was, was civil engineering, and yet we continue to teach them. So what we did is we sent them a survey that uses the Climate Framework Initiative uh, to sense what kind of teaching they are doing around the climate change. And the Climate Framework, as illustrated here, is something that I refer you to the website. But it looks at the human factors, circular economy, energy and carbon, water, ecology, biodiversity, connectivity and transport. And we try to build a survey around this to see what people are doing. So we got the responses from across the country. Those are where the universities are located. The, the larger number here is that's, that's, that's where I am based. Uh, this is the area of Canada where we have more universities and the largest part of the population. So the 55 responses represent uh, 20, uh, 20 accredited Canadian engineering schools. And we looked at the number of courses they teach. In fourth year, there are about 20 plus courses. And then you look at first year, second year, and then the graduate program, very little is really being done. So we divided the, the, the survey into the eight themes of the climate change framework. So I won't go into the details because I'm aware of my time is coming close. I have a very short time left. So so, for example, around the global context and fundamentals, that's one of the themes. And then we divide it into these subsets and see how many courses across Canada are covering any of those aspects. So, without going into the details, that's for the global context and fundamentals. This is for the built environment context. And you see that the low numbers of responses and the limited activities addressing those issues. Then there is a topic called common threads. Um, and you see the subsets uh, that, that we surveyed, then the, the issues around the circular economy, um, the, the 
issues around energy and carbon, uh, you know, courses around about capture anything around ecology and biodiversity, uh, courses that deal with water and as, as it pertains to climate change, the, the issues of transportation sector and connectivity. And when we summarized all of this, we found like a few topics that just tend to be covered a little bit more than others. So for example, sustainable resource use and management, that's the, the, my, one of the largest covered topics uh, across Canada. Um, then there is uh, another topic, the climate change impacts, that is, you know, the impacts from increased temperature, from heat waves, from wind, uh, from sea level, etc. There are about 11 courses that cover that. And then there, there, are, there is a similar number around pollution, or air pollution, water pollution, land pollution. A lot of other topics have very little covers. And we're talking here about a whole country. So, and then we looked at how these, you know, how are we training stu our students really? So the, at the undergraduate level, the approach seems to be that there, is, there isn't a trend to build courses around climate change. What is being done is that cl some climate change concepts are embedded or integrated within, within, within courses. Um, at the graduate level, the approach is somewhat different, where technical material uh, that supports, you know, sustainable development and climate change is is, is taught. So, so, so it's, it's taught through some technical skills rather than, uh, you know, being embedded in courses. There are there aren't courses that are really built around climate change. And when we divide it by area within civil engineering, so you see, like at the undergraduate level. Uh, most most courses that include a bit of climate change were actually in the transportation engineering part of civil engineering. And then the other areas have little coverage and at the graduate level we found that env environmental engineering had, had more. So the main conclusions out of this is that uh, taking ca Canada as a case study, and I assume probably the rest of the world is similar, or maybe a lot of it is even worse, Climate change is not well covered in, in mandatory undergraduate courses, especially in geotechnical engineering courses. You know, geotechnical engineering, all that relates to landslides and permafrost. And, you know, uh, our design codes here in Canada are based on the depth of permafrost, how, how deep the frost goes in the winter in the soil. And those equations are old. Right? Climate change has changed. And that's all we see people designing pipes, thinking that they're not going to be vulnerable to frost or heat frost heave or, 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 or freezing point problems. And they fail because, you know, we haven't adapted, we haven't adapted our design codes to the changing reality of, of climate change. The coverage of policy and global standards is lacking. There is not much coverage of issues around the policy aspects. And that's why, you know, we do things, you now we decide things, but we never implement them because we don't have the, the policies, the robust policies for implementation of those. There is a lack of coverage of, on, on several themes, including ecology and biodiversity. The issue of climate ju justice, equitable and inclusive design is not, is not covered in our courses. And when we look at the industry practice, the same thing, like we have the green building initiative and all that, but it focuses only on one part of the problem. It focuses on the operational carbon, like when you operate a building, how you, how you can save, you know, uh, CO2. But there is a lot also around uh, the reality is that a lot of the carbon is also embodied carbon and about half is embodied carbon and, and the other half is operational carbon. We need to capture both and therefore we have, you know, a green building system, rating system. We also need a zero carbon building standard, you know, where, where we, can, we can build things that are net zero they, they, or, or carbon positive. When we asked our instructors in Canada whether they wish to incorporate more climate change topics in their courses, about 56% said yes. Uh, about a quarter, they say they, 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 you know, they, 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 they don't know how, how, how to implement this, although they, they would like to, but, but they don't know how to do it. So, so uh, there, is a, there is a significant gap, not only in industry practice, not only in the governmental policy making, not only on the international scene and the commitment to policies, but also even in the way we educate our engineers and the gaps around the training that are not helping with the issues of climate change. In 2006, uh, the, there was a, a summit uh, that gathered civil engineering leaders from around the world 
on the future of civil engineer. And at that time, the vision was in 2025, civil engineers will serve as master builders, environmental stewards, innovators and integrators, managers of risk and uncertainty and leaders in shaping public policy. Now, we're 2023 and none of that has happened. And we are, there is very little time to achieve this vision. I think we need to um, have a fix to look uh, around what we do and, and try to come up with creative approaches and revolutionize the way we address, you know, construction uh, towards addressing the problems of climate change. I have very little time where I'm going to mention, I, I promise that I'm going to mention a few things that, you know, trying to do something about it from where I am, from my little scale with my, uh, you know, research team. So among the things we are focusing on right now is, is trying to embed, you know, the UN sustainable uh, development goals and the net zero targets and the policies within 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 the, the, the construction. So in, in, in Canada and North America, Europe, uh, fly ash that was, uh, you know, helpful with, with making cement more sustainable is no longer produced because we're shifting away from power plants that that uh, that burn coal to produce electricity because of the environmental impact. And we're resorting more to sustainable sources of energy. So fly ash is difficult to find. People went to old, you know, landfills that, that had fly ash dumped it there and they started mining it to use it in concrete because there's no fly ash. The other big source of, of, of uh, supplementary cementitious materials, especially in Ontario, the province where I am, is the slag. Uh, and the steel industry now is also progressively shifting to new technologies um, using electrification or using hydrogen uh, for steel production. And, and with that change, the slag they produce is no longer latent hydro hydraulic and not anymore uh, a good supplementary cementitious material. So we need more creative solutions to come up with new binders that, that are that meet the engineering, you know, properties, durability, and yet uh, can be uh, sustainable uh, construction materials. And that's a big focus of what we do right now. Among the things that we have done, for example, uh, we, we, we are developing binders that not only decrease the embodied carbon, so replacing about 50% of the clinker in the cement, but also decrease the operational carbon. So we're using composites that have phase change materials that absorb energy and release it at the appropriate time. And, and so when we do uh, studies, you know, simulating the thermal behavior, um, it can it can reduce the the, the temperature fluctuations within uh, indoor indoor temperature by about 3.5 degrees Celsius. And when you calculate, you know, the savings in HVAC that can be generated by that, it could be substantial. So that is a, a very important area of interest for us. Um, my university in Canada is called the Nuclear University. We are the university with the most, with the largest nuclear research operation. So uh, one of the very popular topics now is the shifting from the traditional nuclear uh, power plants with all the risks associated and the challenges to what we call now the small modular nuclear reactors. You know, comparing the scale, this is how a conventional nuclear reactor looks like versus the small modular reactor. These can be deployed in more remote areas, small areas that can create their own electricity grid and therefore, with clean nuclear energy it is, uh, that is safe, it's possible to, you know, uh, green the energy supply uh, further beyond what we do with wind and uh, and solar. So, uh, you know, most of what a nuclear reactor is, like is 80% or more, is civil infrastructure, basically concrete construction. And that concrete construction needs to be designed for, to be resilient for high temperature, resilient for radiation shielding, resilient for blasts. And that is uh, an important focus of research. Uh, what we do a lot of defrosting in Canada. And, you know, we need to melt the snow uh, to ease traffic during the winter. And uh, so self-deicing uh, pavements and, and bridge decks, you know, a lot of the corrosion, the billions of dollars of corrosion are inflected by chlorides coming from the icing salts in the buildings. And they're also causing substantial pollution uh, you know, due to uh, increased salt levels. So coming up with pavements that can defrost themselves without the need for the icing salts is, is an important focus. 
Uh, another important focus uh, for us recently is, unfortunately, we can't stop world wars around around the world. And from where I am here in Canada, to everyone listening to this presentation now or listening to it on YouTube, uh, I send a message of of peace that you know we can we have to learn to resolve conflicts in a peaceful manner. We have to, you know, treat our neighbor nicely. That neighbor being a person or being a country. We need to, as humans, learn how to live together in, in peace, not bombarding dams and flooding areas or bombarding cities and destroying, you know, uh, infrastructure and people. From our side, uh, what we're trying is trying to, to design structures or change structures to become more resilient to blast events. So uh, what you see here are, are simulations of, of, you know, explosions between two buildings or explosions between, between two uh streets and how you know the blast waves reflect and and so on and can we create systems of engineered smart systems that can actually uh you know uh, you know address those 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 energies uh, and then try to save people and reduce the damage on on critical civil infrastructure around around the world and here you see some of the you know simulations that my phd student is is doing right now around that that, that topic so uh, I know that my time is um, like I have only a few minutes. So I'm gonna I wanna jump to a few quick con conclusions. Um, they're not organized in any preferential manner, but th these are foods for thought items that that I gathered from the presentation that I'd like you to go home with. Uh, I would first I will focus on education. The current approach to teaching climate change in undergraduate classes is is by integrating them into core courses, but yet there are no coverage. Uh, uh, no courses that are intended to cover any climate change, at least in Canada, and there is a large gap in, in there. The lack of climate change coverage in many civil engineering areas that are critical, geotechnical, structural, construction management, uh, we don't see a lot of, you know, adaptation. Um, you know, our design codes are outdated, and they need to be adapted to climate change. You know, adaptation to climate change is another very important aspect that needs a lot of engineering focus. There is the aspect of fighting climate change, and there is the aspect also of, of adapting, uh, you know, to climate change so that we mitigate the, lo the losses. Uh, we still see large uh, lack of coverage of, of policies, standards, ecology, biodiversity, climate justice, equitable and inclusive design, and what we teach to our students. So instructors are encouraged to to, 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 to come up with best practices and, and, be, and, and enhance their awareness to train the next generation of, of engineers who are going to deal with the substantial challenges that are emerging. Um, the strategies and policies deployed around the world to combat climate change and the decarbonized economy have by and large failed, unfortunately, and therefore climate change has keep, kept rising unabated and has become an existential threat, something we really need to focus on our energy instead of competing and producing more, more weapons and, 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 you know, killing each other in, in wars instead of trying to save humanity as a whole. Um, for the specific case of carbon emissions from cement and concrete, our fragmented view of the problem has led to mitigated schemes and strategies that, that often amount to greenwashing and have not really solved the problem. The sustainability of, of concrete and other sectors of economy is a complex system of systems uh, we, but that, is, that is affected by uh, time-dependent feedbacks and, and, and different parts of the system affecting other parts and therefore it needs to be addressed in its holistic and complex uh, uh, manner. Systems thinking offers a way to, to address tackle such, such problems. Uh, it captures better the outcomes of policies for reducing carbon emissions and perhaps would lighten better what we, the way we, we should approach climate change in a more sophisticated, more robust, more comprehensive, uh, more comprehensive manner. Uh, social problems, environmental problems, economic problems are more complex than the technical problems we deal with as engineers. Uh, so, so uh, we need to be aware of that and we need to become educated in the complexity of the other systems involved in what we do in, in construction and, and civil engineering. 
Um, we're still hopeful that we can win the climate change race, but we are running out of time. And continuing business as usual is really risky and very damaging. And therefore, professionals dealing with the, prof the built environment like ourselves, we need to implement drastic and, and deep and profound changes in our practice to, to reduce the embedded uh, or embodied carbon in what we do in, in our projects and also reducing the operational car carbon of the built environment to do our share of trying to, to mitigate the issues of climate change. A better enforcement of policies, better planning of those policies, and making them you know, uh, comprehensive and well thought and impactful. Uh, should be should be helpful. The adaptation to climate change is still lacking momentum, and our design codes are la are lagging. Um, the whole picture right now uh, is associated with with issues of, of social justice implications, where you see the poor, the more vulnerable, the marginalized, you know, uh, exposed to food insecurity, lack of drinking water crossing borders, you know, problems of social justice, violence, and things that, that can threaten world peace. Um, a message, the final message to every one of us involved in, in, in the construction and, and uh, build environment business is that we need to work hand in hand in a concerted manner and we need to be creative and come up with different solutions, hopefully, to, you know, um, protect the, the future generations to come with that, I thank you all for your attention. Very pleased to be your uh, uh, keynote speaker today. Uh, this is a picture of my, our campus. McMaster University is not far from the largest city of Toronto in Canada. We are very short distance from Niagara Falls, so the more very famous Niagara Falls. So if you come to Canada, you know, come visit. And with that, I thank you very much, and I will be very happy to, um, you know. Listen to any comments or if I can answer some of your questions. Thank you very much again. If anybody have any questions, um, you can please raise it. Uh, I wanted to ask a question regarding uh, sustainable cities. Like, um, the need of the hour is that we have to go for high rise construction, but uh, it is not really easy to implement green buildings when you have uh, really tall structures or skyscrapers. So, how can we tackle an uh, infrastructure problem like that? Uh, could you could you rephrase the question? There's a bit of background and I was not able to understand. So uh, I'll type it in the chat box. I'm 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 I'm, I'm actually not hearing you very well, uh, Miraja. If I read the name properly, so I'm asking Preeti to, to rephrase it for me so that I can hear it properly. Thank you. Yeah, Miraja, can you just type the question on the chat box? Uh, by the time anyone else can, uh, if you have any doubts regarding the session, can raise a question here. Everything is clear, uh, Preeti, it seems. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, uh, I have one. I mean, I have one uh, suggestion or something like that. What I have understood from your uh, talk is that uh, you said about all the problems and also uh, what we are facing now. That is, uh, we are not taking any uh, I mean, steps to improve or considering the climatic changes because everything is done for improving the present situation. And after that, we face it as a difficulty later in the later stage because we build so many infrastructure, then we face the traffic congestion or uh, some some difficulties will be faced because of the development. So that is a reality which we are also facing in India also. 
because uh, here also we develop so in a uh, in a very uh, um, i mean dr uh, drastic manner but the later stage we face it as a difficulty itself but uh, the yeah. one thing is that the cement consumption that you have said it is producing so much of carbon emission but still we are using it so even though there are so many replacement of cement still we are uh, normal construction was we are uh, used in, uh, in, in using the practice of uh, again and again we are uh, consuming cement itself but if we have to change it as a whole uh, to improve the uh, climatic condition isn't it very difficult to change it as a whole because it is a very it has emerged in a very vast manner so is it possible to uh, change that uh, practices which we have followed for so many years it, will it not take a longer period than which ha which it has taken for emerging is it possible yeah so so so, so you you are you are right that the, the construction industry has a lot of inertia and and change change is not easy when cement is the uh, the world's largest used consumed commodity after water so humans consume water number one and concrete number two <laughs> so so if you wake up tomorrow and stop that practice is, is very is very difficult and and india is no no exception i mean as as developing countries try to catch up with the standards of living of developing countries like if uh, if, if, if people in north america and europe you know they live with this standard why can't we also you know live with that standard and in that in that progress that many countries, populated countries around the world are progressing in that direction. There is a lot of infrastructure development. In fact, in fact, more than half of the cement production is, is happening in, in China and, and India comes next. Uh, yeah. so, so there is a lot of cement production. Good thing to know is that in India, you still can, you continue to produce a lot of fly ash, unlike other countries. So the production of the production of energy from coal is itself a problem. It's generating a lot of CO2. But at least, you know, when there is that much fly ash being generated, there is an opportunity to, to cut down cement consumption by half or close to half. And, yes. and, if, we, and if we come up with more uh, creative ternary and quaternary blends that involve not only cement and fly ash, but other things that can counteract the effect of negative effects of fly ash in reducing, for example, uh, you know, uh, decelerating or, or, or retarding the behavior of concrete. There are many things that are, that are possible. So when the awareness is there, when we think the design, you know, just thinking shallow, designing for structural performance, but we also design with, stand, with meeting standards for, for uh, you know, close to net zero or maybe carbon positive because you can reduce a lot the emissions from from the cement but you can also design to reduce a lot the emissions related to the uh, use of the building the operational uh, use of, of the building and if that awareness is there i think we can we can make a large a large impact um, many countries now have signed up for what we call the net zero goal like yeah. trying to reduce emissions by by half by 2030 and become uh, carbon neutral by 2050. To tell you the truth, it's very ambitious right now. I don't see a path forward for achieving that. It's, it, it sounds like an ambitious, it's beautiful goal again that we're going to miss. Yeah, <laughs> and then we have also that <laughs> 2070. We have fo we are yeah, so, focusing on that goal, but yeah. the steps to be taken is a very tedious one. Yeah. Because uh, so I see some. Yeah, so Neera has shared her question so. The yeah, I, I, yeah, I see Niraja's question saying we need to implement sustainable cities, but we also need high rise structures. How can we balance the need for housing and sustainable infrastructure? Yeah. Um, so wh wh whether we are building, you know, high rise or, or low rise, uh, there, are, there are different, different challenges. So um, a high rise has, has some advantages, you know, uh, one of the most energy intensive part of construction is the foundation component of, of a building and you know with a high rise you only have a smaller you know land footprint so there is an advantage in that manner and there are some other advantages as, as you rise higher also temperature decreases so so the demand on on uh, on, on cooling decrease too so 
these can be balanced. The challenge of building high is you need stronger, stronger materials, but there are creative ways of building, building stronger. Uh, uh, so, um, for example, the use of ultra high performance concrete or materials, uh, you can, you can have, you can replace uh, a square meter footprint of a column with something that is maybe 30, 40% of that. So you're using less material. It's stronger. Yes. It probably has more carbon per unit volume, but you're using less, less of the material. Uh, and then you can build high rise in a sustainable, a sustainable manner. A part of, of sustainability is also durability. We keep using low quality materials, but you, you need to repair in a few years and the repair also has a, foot, a carbon footprint and you need to de reconstruct in a short time, which also doubles the carbon footprint. We can design things that last easily a century and a half and we, we we're building a bridge the last decade and then we go replace them. So that it, it's a multifaceted problem. And if I keep, if I give you an answer now, I'm going to use them. I'm going to use a mental model like the elementary school of my daughter to grab. So I need, you need to create a model for this, like uh, how high rise buildings compare to, uh, you know, low rise, but balancing the housing need and sustainable infrastructure. If we build the sustainable uh, practices in the design approaches from the very beginning, from the conceptual design, then we have better, better chances. What we're doing now is we just Talk the talk, but don't walk the walk. We just talk about sustainability, but we do nothing about it, and we keep, you know, just, you know, making the problem much worse. Um, it's difficult to make a skyscraper green, in my understanding. Um, I, it's debatable. It's debatable. I think it's it's it's, it's off the subject, but uh, I was I was involved personally in the next tallest building in the world, and in the current third tallest building in the world. The next building in the world, the first to exceed one kilometer, it's in construction, and uh, the third one, the third tallest, is about 601 meter tall. And yes, I mean there is a lot of, uh, you know, if 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 you take uh, this building that I'm talking about, the third tallest building, it's also the building with the largest floor space on earth. This building, and if you build that flat instead, uh, you're going to make strong like it's going to be difficult to make a case that. But the flat construction is more sustainable than the vertical construction. But it's debatable, and I respect your opinion. I think it's something that needs that needs study in a, in a more robust way. Uh, there is a, uh, there is a question from Jawahar. Uh, you spoke about the carbon footprint of the construction industry. Is the move from RCC structures to steel structures actually helping? Um, yeah, moving from reinforced concrete structures to steel structures. Steel has a huge Carbon footprint. Uh, it, it's not a clean construction. Um, I, I, I think, uh, and it's difficult to replace all the concrete with steel. Uh, concrete is the is cheaper, is more abundant, uh, more available. Uh, people have more access to it. You can construct it in any shape you want, just using a form. While steel is is more more challenging. And there are many other advantages for concrete as well. I think we need to look at each of them. And trying to make the practices more sustainable, and more and more come up with, you know, uh, greener uh, materials or combinations of materials. You know, it could be just hybrid system. Perhaps the the best system would be a hybrid system where we where we synergize, you know, the you know the, the strengths of materials and 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 they com they they compensate for each other's you know weaknesses. Uh, there is a lot to be to be explored in there. Uh, also, there are flaws in the current energy rating systems. Yes, um, there are flaws pretty much everywhere, but energy uh, rating systems uh, need rethinking and, and need to, to capture aspects beyond the aspects that are included right now. And that's also an area for further exploration. Uh, don't see any more questions, and I hope I'm not overusing my time. So. Yeah, thank you, sir, for uh, uh, sharing your thought. I would like to invite uh, Ms. Jyotika for delivering the vote of thanks. Hello, good morning. It's my indeed esteem and privilege to deliver a word of gratitude on this moment. First of all, let me thank God, God Almighty for making this a very resonating occasion. We are extremely grateful to Chief Guest of the session, Professor Mansaf Al-Nahdi, 
uh, Chair Department of Civil Engineering, McMaster University, Canada, for sparing his valuable time and information regarding required paradigm shifts for sustainability and quality in construction. As proud civil engineers, this will surely help us think in an innovative path. A modest way of thank you to Dr. Gigi Anthony, Head of Department Civil Engineering, who has been a constant source of inspiration, rousing our spirits high with utmost love. I thank our faculty and students for all this endless efforts for making this a great success. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank, thank you, you, sir. Thank you. It has been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Take care, everyone.